Yes, as Peter said, it's from the reading this morning's from uh, Acts chapter 18 and starting at verse 18, which is on page 786, if you have one of the church Bibles. Acts chapter 18, verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Kincreai because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord And he spoke with great fervour and taught about Jesus accurately, although he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. May the Lord bless this reading from his word. Amen. Well, we've been working our way through the, uh, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, we're coming now to the end of Paul's second missionary journey and the beginning of his third one. But here in this passage that's been read to us in Acts 18, uh, we have a fascinating little insight into how Paul conducts his ministry. And we have that joyful, that joy-filling little episode about Priscilla and Aquila, tent makers, tradespeople, used by God to his glory in quite a magnificent way. So I've entitled the message this morning, Being Culturally Aware and Biblically Knowledgeable. Being culturally aware and biblically knowledgeable. Paul was culturally aware. Priscilla and Aquila were biblically knowledgeable. And we're going to see in this passage this morning that effective witness as a church and our effective witness as individuals requires all of us to be both culturally aware, as Paul was, and as biblically knowledgeable as Priscilla and Aquila were. In their own ways, both Paul and Priscilla and Aquila are role models for us as we think about what the Christian life means for us and what difference it should make to our lives and and where our place might be in what God has for us. Well, we know from verse 11 that Paul stayed at Corinth for 18 months under the tolerant eye of the Roman proconsul. Then in verse 1... uh, (coughs) Sorry, in verse 18 of Acts chapter 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And we're not told why Paul decided to leave Corinth. 
Up until now, Luke has explained how either the Lord directed Paul to where he should go or Paul left town because of mounting opposition. And, and there was little opposition in Corinth to his ministry, so we can safely assume that the Lord has told Paul that it's time to go. And you notice in verse 21, that at the end of verse 21, that indeed Paul does say, I will come back if it is God's will. So he's very conscious of the fact that his arrival and departures are very much in accordance with God's purpose and design. So in some way, the Lord must be making this very clear to him. So Paul leaves Corinth, heading back home to Antioch, Syria via Jerusalem, and we have a map. Thank you, Philip. And uh, so you, Paul was at Corinth. Can you see Corinth there? There we go. Uh, Philip's put the cursor on Corinth. And if you can just, Philip, follow that line, that red line, all the way to Ephesus, that's right, and then on, from Ephesus down across the, the sea all the way down to where well, it just disappears to uh, uh, Caesarea. That's right. And then, uh, that's right, there we go all the way to Caesarea, and then he, then Paul drops down to Jerusalem, and then he goes all the way back up to Antioch there in Syria, which uh, is his home church. And that whole area, uh, that whole travel is being covered by this morning's scripture. So he left Corinth, and his intention was to go to Ephesus, then on to Caesarea, Jerusalem, and back home to Antioch. And and he took Priscilla and Aquila with him. Now you'll remember that he left uh, Luke and Silas and Timothy behind on the Greek peninsula to encourage the churches there. They'd been planted by his preaching. And, and Paul isn't a man to travel on his own. And he was going to be taking a long journey on his own. So he asked Priscilla and Aquila to come with him. Now he'd been living with them for a year and a half. They knew each other well. And uh, uh, so they embarked with him. And, and it seems like that he intended to take them the whole way, but in fact, he left them at their first po at their first port of call on Ephesus. They parted company. So why did he leave them in Ephesus? Well, perhaps because the people there wanted to hear more about Jesus. You see in verse 19? They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. And he left. So perhaps it's because that there in Ephesus, he found a synagogue which was very open to his message and to his ministry. But he had to leave. So he left Priscilla and Aquila behind to make their tents and encourage the brethren and strengthen the church and to be a blessing to folks. Paul was keen to go on. Why was Paul so keen to leave Ephesus? Bit of a mystery, isn't it? I mean, remember on his first missionary journey, Paul had wanted to visit Ephesus, but the Lord had prevented him. Instead, it directed him up to Troas and then over the Aegean Sea. And now, finally, Paul has the opportunity to come to Ephesus, and he's no sooner there than he leaves. What's going on? Well, I think the answer is there in uh, verse uh, 18. Towards the end of verse 18, before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea because of a vow that he had taken. Now, if you're looking on the map there and you see Corinth, you see just under Corinth is the little word Sincrea. And that's the port that Paul sailed from to go to Ephesus. But what was going on for Paul that he took a vow and had a haircut and was so soon ready to leave Ephesus? a city where even the synagogue Jews were keen to hear what he had to say. Well, every indication suggests that this vow that Paul took was a Nazarite vow. And the Nazarite vow is explained for us in Numbers chapter 6. And uh, <clears throat> this afternoon, after you've had your nap, you can look at Numbers chapter 6 and get a little bit of a background as to what was going on here. And Paul took this Nazarite vow. Now, the purpose of the Nazarite vow, and we're told there in Numbers chapter 6, that any man or woman could do this. It wasn't restricted to the priestly caste. Anyone could do this, any man or woman of the, of the tribe of Israel. And what you do is you, you shave your head completely and then you take a vow of purification and separation to the Lord. You're going to live as a Nazarite, as it were. You're not allowed to drink alcohol and not allowed to do all kinds of things for the period of this purification. 
And after 30 days, you go to the tabernacle or to the temple and you shave off again what has grown in those 30 days and that hair you offer as a sacrifice to the Lord. And then your vow is over. And you can go back to regular living. Well, that's what Paul did. At Sancria, he took a vow. And he would have had to take his vow in the synagogue at Sancria because the synagogue has to make note of the vow, make a record of it, because within 30 days you have to appear at the temple in Jerusalem, shave your head again and offer your sacrifices. So that's why Paul had to leave Ephesus in a big hurry. He had to get to Jerusalem within 30 days. Well, why did he do it? Why did he take this vow of purification? Paul, who spent most of his time and his writings in his life talking about the fact that we no longer need to keep these laws. His whole life of ministry was based on a ministry to the Gentiles which didn't require the Gentiles to adhere to Mosaic law. So why did Paul take this vow? Well, it's because he was planning to visit Jerusalem on his way home. He was planning to visit Jerusalem and report to the apostles and the church there of all that had happened on his journeys through Asia and through Greece. And he knew that in coming back to Jerusalem, he was going back to the center and the powerhouse of Judaism and observance of the Mosaic law. By taking a Nazarite vow, Paul might be more acceptable to the Jews in Jerusalem. And this was exactly the strategy urged on Paul by the apostles in Jerusalem when he visited that city at a later time to this one. Let me just refer you to Acts 21, verse 17. This is when Paul arrived at Jerusalem on another occasion other than the one in Acts chapter 18. And this is the strategy that the apostles used to help keep the peace in the city. In Acts chapter 21, verse 17, when we, that is Paul and, and Luke, arrived at Jerusalem, their brothers greeted us warmly. Acts 21, 18, the next day Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? <laughs> that was the apostles in Jerusalem's dilemma. What shall we do? We have Paul here. Paul is a lightning rod for Jewish opposition. What shall we do to preserve the peace and the serenity in Jerusalem so the church can continue to minister? What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. And so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men and join in the purification rites and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Verse 25. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. And then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offerings would be made for each of them. That was the strategy they used, you see. Paul comes to Jerusalem. Well, Paul, you should take a Nazarite vow. It's only for 30 days. And you should go through all the ritual. And then the Jews will, will be okay and they'll understand that, in fact, a lot of the accusations made against you are not true. So you remember in Acts chapter 18, for instance, and verse 13, this man they charged as persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to our law. But notice that as the Jerusalem apostles suggested this strategy to Paul, they were not saying that Gentile Christians or Christians generally should keep these vows. 
In other words, they wanted Paul to do it for the sake of expediency and public relations, not because it was a necessity that God required of Christian believers. Because you notice there in Acts 21, as they were laying out this suggestion to Paul, they made it very clear in Acts 21, 25, that they were not deviating from the decision as to the Gentile freedom they made at the great council in Acts chapter 15. Remember in Acts chapter 15, they had this big council and they decided that the, the Gentile Christians did not need to be circumcised. They did not need to keep the Jewish rituals and vows. And so they sent this letter out through Paul and through others, rescuing them from the, from the enslavement of observing Mosaic law. So now when they impress upon Paul the need to keep this Nazarite vow, they want to be very careful to say, this in no way encroaches on our decision in Acts chapter 15. This is for expedience only. Sometime later, when Paul was writing a letter to the Corinthian church, he explained his actions to them. You could imagine that around his, church, his churches in the, in the areas where he had been, they would have heard that Paul had taken this vow in Jerusalem, and perhaps they would have wondered, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? Are we, are we free from these rituals and, and, and vows, or do we, have to, do we have to keep them? It might have raised confusion. And so when Paul was writing back to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he explained what he was doing. One Corinthians chapter nine, verse nineteen. One Corinthians nine nineteen. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. This is why Paul took that vow at St. Crea and shaved his head. Because he was returning to the very center and powerhouse of Judaism. So he would become like a Jew while he was there. He would place himself under the Mosaic law, though as he says in 1 Corinthians 9, I am free from that law, I'll place myself under it in order to bring the gospel of God's grace to bear upon my Jewish brethren. Paul was taking on board the culture in which he was stepping and to which he sought to minister. It was a culture which saw these things as very important. Paul knew that by taking them on board and participating in them, he was in no way denying or stepping away from the free grace that he has in Jesus Christ. So he took a Nazarite vow because he knew he was heading for Jerusalem. And perhaps that's why he was so well received by the synagogue in Ephesus. Because he came among them as one who had just taken a Nazarite vow. Is there a lesson in that, in all of this for us? Yes, I think there is. Being theologically orthodox does not require us to be culturally conservative. Being theologically orthodox does not require us to be culturally conservative. For the sake of the gospel, and in order to share its blessings with others that they might be saved, we are free to participate in their culture while remaining under the law of Christ. Jesus is our glorious example. Jesus was not culturally conservative in his day. But Jesus was theologically orthodox. 
He participated in his culture for the sake of the people who needed to hear his message, and he did it without sinning. And so he would go up to uh, Syrophoenicia, and he would have a meal in the house of a Syrophoenician woman. He would talk to the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well there. Things which, which were appropriate for the culture of the person he was speaking to, but required him to step out of the culture that he had been raised in. He did it without sinning. You see, he did it for the sake of bringing gospel grace to bear on people for whom his culture might have been a stumbling block if he had taken his culture with him into those encounters. Well, we too have a message for all people. We have a message for all nations, for all language, tribes and cultures. And, and so we too must participate in their culture if they are to hear our message. While remaining bound to the law of Christ and to personal holiness. So that Christ would not be obscured by our cultural participation, but will rather shine forth as a light in a dark place as we participate in order to build relationships that can bear the weight of truth. Praying always that the Lord will grant a favorable reception to our gospel witness. Now you probably know that Auckland is one of the most multicultural cities in the whole world. And there's a, good, there's a good chance that one of your near neighbors is someone not of a culture like yourself. Being theologically orthodox does not require us to be culturally conservative. There's nothing about our culture that we need to hold on to as precious, that cannot be surrendered. To the Jews I became as a Jew. To the Gentiles I became as a Gentile because I am under the law of Christ. In Jesus Christ, I find my identity. I don't find my identity by participating and belonging to any particular culture or ethnic identity. My identity is found in Jesus Christ, and that sets me free. And that sets you free to participate in the culture of your neighbors. Remaining under the law of Christ, remaining committed to personal holiness so that they might see in you something they've never seen before. And through your life and through your witness, you offer them some options. Options perhaps that they would never find in their own culture. So, culturally aware and biblically knowledgeable. Well, that brings us to verse 22 in Acts 18. Verse 22 covers a lot of ground. Paul is on the move. Now, you remember now, Paul is on his own. And Luke can only record what Paul tells him. And, and it seems like Paul didn't tell him a whole lot about what happened in verse 22. And so Luke just gives us a, uh, a very brief account in verse 22. When he landed at Caesarea, okay, so we left him at Ephesus. Verse 22, he's now at Caesarea. He went up and greeted the church. It's the church in Jerusalem. And then he went down to Antioch. So from Jerusalem, he goes all the way back to Antioch. So in verse 22, leaves us back home at Antioch where Paul came from. And in the very next verse is the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. Verse 23, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Pygera, strengthening all the disciples. So if you're looking on your map, you see uh, Galatia there. It's kind of uh, written right across the map from top to bottom. And uh, uh, this was the area of his first missionary journey. So now he's setting out to encourage the churches there. So verse 23 is the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, next time we'll have a map of Paul's third missionary journey. But from verse 23 we're told that he's left Antioch and he's now traveling west again across that great road the Romans built from Antioch to Ephesus. This is the big, Verse 23 is the beginning of Paul's 
third missionary journey, and unbeknownst to Paul, this will be his last journey. He doesn't know that, but this will be the last journey he's going to be able to take to these churches. It'll be his last visit to the churches that were planted through his preaching. And after this time, all his encouragements to those churches and those believers would come through his letters. He will be unable to visit them. And on his third missionary journey, he began by returning to the scene of his first missionary journey, visiting the churches his gospel preaching had established. And we see from Acts chapter 19 verse 1, his purpose was to travel all the way to Ephesus. Because he had not forgotten the people there to whom he had made the promise to return. I will return. Uh, 19.1, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Well, <clears throat> let's go back to Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila had been left behind in Ephesus to make tents, to strengthen the church and encourage the believers. Now these two who had lived with Paul for 18 months in Corinth were well able to continue the ministry Paul had begun in Ephesus. In fact, uh, sometime later in the book of Romans 16, Paul had opportunity to talk about Priscilla and Aquila. By the time you get to Romans 16, Priscilla and Aquila are no longer in Ephesus. They're back in Rome. And as Paul writes to the Roman church, this is what he says in, in Acts 16.3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their house. So fellow workers of Paul who risked their lives to be with Paul. Here they are ministering with a little house church in Rome and there in Ephesus they were doing the same thing. So they were well able to take care of Apollos. Paulus arrived in Ephesus with three PhDs. Verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He came from Alexandria, which was uh, uh, in Egypt, on the, Dol on the, on the uh, River Nile, on the delta of the River Nile. It was the second largest city in, Rome, in the empire after Rome. It had a library there with more books in it than any other library in the whole of the ancient world. It was, a, it was a place of great learning. It was there that the Old Testament was translated into Greek about 100 years before Christ. So if he came from Alexandra and he was a learned man, then you know he had spent time in the universities there and was considered very highly educated among the people of his day. He was a man with a powerful speaking gift, and much learning, and yet he had a deficient theology. He preached the baptism of John, not realizing that all that John pointed forward to was fulfilled in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Now Priscilla and Aquila loved the gospel too much to let it go. They had been with Paul. So they invited Apollos to their home to talk with him about Jesus. Verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Apollos was humble enough to receive from these gentle but mature couple the gospel of Jesus Christ. This learned man from Alexandria was willing to be instructed by tent makers. The effect on his understanding and his ministry was immediate and was a great help to all who by grace had believed. He was able to show powerfully from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. You see that in verse 28. Proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Remember Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension spent 40 days showing his disciples how all the scriptures were fulfilled in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And that was the message the apostles took into the world as their great commission. This was the message that Paul was instructed in by Jesus himself. And this was the message he passed on to Priscilla and Aquila. And this was the message they passed on to Apollos. And this was the message Apollos passed on 